I want to welcome everyone um, on behalf of Chillicothe Public Library to tonight's presentation on family law with Denise Conklin of Prairie State Legal Services. And this is the second of three conversations on legal aid topics that we're hosting this summer. If you're here on Zoom, you're probably already registered for all of them <clears throat> and will automatically get a reminder for the final session next month. But if you're watching on Facebook, you may want to register through Zoom in order to get the webinar link and the reminder emails. And I did drop that link into the Facebook comments for you. Um, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to mention. Um, if you hover over the Zoom screen, you'll see a series of tools at the bottom. You can click on chat to comment or interact with one another. To view automated closed captioning, please click on the closed captioning live transcript icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen and select show subtitle. If you want to hide the subtitles, you can click hide subtitle. Tonight's program is being recorded and the recording will be available to view on the library's Facebook page and YouTube channel. The presentation will be about 30 minutes followed by a time for questions. You can use the Q&A tool or the chat to submit questions. You can also use the raise hand tool to indicate that you have a question and I will unmute you so that you can ask that verbally. And now it is my honor to introduce our speaker. Denise Conklin is managing attorney for Peoria Galesburg Office of Prairie State Legal Services. She began her career at Prairie State as a volunteer attorney in the Peoria office in 2004 and became a staff attorney in 2007. Denise became managing attorney in 2009. Prior to joining Prairie State, Denise worked as a senior associate in the litigation department of the Catton Rosenman Law Firm in Chicago. She graduated magna cum laude with a Juris Doctor degree from University of Illinois College of Law and is admitted to practice law in the state of Illinois and in the United States District Court for the Northern and Central Districts of Illinois. Her practice focuses on all aspects of poverty law, including family law, government benefits, education law, and housing law. Denise Conklin, welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much to Akathi Public Library for having this Facebook Live and this webinar so that people can learn a little bit more about poverty law and the work that Prairie State does. I appreciate the the time here. So um, just want to start out by just reiterating from last time, Prairie State Legal Services is our community's legal aid organization. We provide free civil legal services to low-income individuals. We also have some grants that allow us to go above the federal poverty level, uh, including domestic violence grants, which I will talk about today. Uh, so the idea behind legal aid is really twofold giving a voice to people who would otherwise not have a voice. And as I think last time I mentioned in our Pledge of Allegiance, we end that with and justice for all. So the idea that regardless of income level, everyone has access to the justice system in our country. And the other goal of legal aid is poverty alleviation. So these programs that I'm talking about um, where Prairie State serves low-income individuals or to help individuals move past their crisis and their um, barriers that they're experiencing and move into a space of self-sufficiency uh, in their own lives. Last time I mentioned that our office has four primary areas of practice. The first one being our safety cases. That's where individuals are coming to us who are victims of domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, we help with the emergency situation, the order of protection, the civil no contact order, and also the more permanent solution, whether it's divorce or a um, custody type case, guardianship, power of attorney. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail in just a minute on those issues. But our office handles three other areas of practice too. Uh, the second being housing. We help individuals who are being wrongfully denied housing. It can be really any type of housing. It might be a nursing home discharge where somebody is being wrongfully kicked out of a nursing home. It could be a foreclosure or a basic landlord tenant eviction or a rent to own contract for deed situation. I did wanna make sure that I pointed out that during this time of uh, moving out of the COVID pandemic, 
um, there has been a federal and state moratorium on evictions. And I um, talked about that a little bit last time, but where we are in that moment is there is a lot of rental assistance available in the community. The idea is several or many people have fallen behind on paying rent due to loss of employment during COVID and many landlords are owed money uh, in rent. And right now there is a lot of rental assistance both from the federal government and the state government to try to fill that gap so that landlords become whole on the rent that they are owed and tenants um, catch up on their obligations so that no one needs to be evicted at the end of the eviction moratorium. If you or anyone you know is in need of rental assistance, please call 211. It's kind of like dialing 911, but you dial 211, which is our community's local information resource. It is um, staffed and supported by Heart of Illinois United Way and is a wonderful resource when you call that number 211. Um, they will ask you what your need is and you can simply say, I'm in need of rental assistance or utility assistance or whatever the issue is. And um, 211 keeps an update of all the resources in our community and they can point you in the right direction. Uh, our third area of practice is public benefits. And that is where a client comes to us who is being wrong, a wrongfully denied a government public benefit. And it literally can be anything, government benefit, uh, social security disability, link card, food stamp situation, Medicaid, temporary assistance to needy families, veterans benefits, unemployment, you name it. Uh, so if you know of someone who is in need of those services, please, be sure to uh, share the information about Prairie State Legal. And our fourth area of practice is ready to work. I'll talk about that during our next session in more detail. But in those cases, we are helping individuals move past uh, criminal records or other barriers to obtaining employment to help that client obtain employment and self-sufficiency in their life. So the public benefits relating to social security disability uh, is directed at individuals who are too disabled to work. Our ready to work program is to help people who are able to work, who want to work and help them move past a barrier to gain employment. Prairie State Legal Services as the legal aid provider in our community never charges attorney's fees. We pay our bills with grants and private donations. Um, so all of our services are free to our clients. All right, so in this session, we're gonna take a little bit more of a deep dive into that safety aspect of Prairie State Legal Services work. I just want to share that I'm not giving any advice during this um, recorded session. Uh, this really is information in the area of family law and what specifically Prairie State does. If, as you're watching this, you see that these are issues that you or someone you know is experiencing. I would encourage you to um, either apply at Prairie State if, if you believe that you would fall within the types of cases we handle or talk with an attorney because really on these issues, you need to talk to an attorney and get into the details of what's going on and the specific fact situation. What I'll do during this uh, time together is really talk about the overall issues, just as a, a general overview of all of these issues. All right, so here we go. Family law is a huge area of need in our community. Um, about a quarter of Prairie State's practice deals with family law. And our family law practice primarily starts with domestic violence um, victims. So those cases come to us as safety cases either through an order of protection or some other um, issue that has brought the client who's a victim of domestic violence to our door. And like I said at the beginning, we help with that emergency issue and also the more permanent issue, whether it's divorce or um, guardianship or power of attorney or um, some type of parenting plan. During our time together, I'm gonna talk through these issues. Um, a couple of overarching themes that you will hear. One of them is when someone files something in court, they are submitting themselves to the jurisdiction of the court and the judge. So many of these issues can be resolved 
outside of court. Some of them, you need the court's involvement. If you want to divorce someone, dissolve a marriage, you do need a judge to enter that. If you want to get a court ordered guardianship, you need a judge. But many of these issues that I'm going to talk about that Prairie State handles can be handled outside of court. So that really is the first thing to think about when you come to Prairie State and you're talking with the attorney. The attorney will share the client's rights, their responsibilities, and their options. And I just want to start out this conversation on this area of family law and safety cases with people have options. Often clients come to us very desperate. They're in crisis. A family situation has broken apart. And whether it's a divorce or, or whatever the situation is, they're hurrying to get to it because they think that will stop the pain, will solve the problem. And one thing that our attorneys do when we describe what the client's options are is we explain, you don't have to go to court. You can perhaps get to your goals in a different way. So I just wanna open up that space as a reality that um, family law doesn't have to involve the court system. The other overarching theme that you'll hear is best interest of the child. Uh, right now, under Illinois law, best interest of the child is the theme and really the emphasis that it's not a winning situation or a losing situation as far as who wins or loses in court, but the emphasis really is if there are children involved, who is going to be responsible for these children, both parents. It's not that somebody has a right to the children. It's that the parents are going to be responsible for the children. So as a marriage or as a family situation breaks apart, that is going to be, if you go to court, the primary consideration the judge is going to be looking at is who's taking care of these kids and how is this going to be divided? All right, so talking about uh, divorce specifically. So um, that is something that Prairie State uh, does as a part of our practice. It's actually technically called a dissolution of marriage, and, but that's just a fancy name for a divorce. You do have to go to court to get a divorce in Illinois, and it's under a law that's called the Illinois Marriage and Dissolution of Marriage Act. We are in a no-fault state, meaning um, you don't have to prove that somebody did something wrong to get a divorce. The law changed a while back, and now the uh, grounds or the standard for divorce is called irreconcilable differences. It's basically that irreconcilable differences have caused an irretrievable breakdown of this marriage. Efforts at reconciliation have failed and future efforts are not in the best interest of the family. Basically, people just can't get along. Because this is a no fault state, meaning you don't have to prove somebody was at fault to get a divorce, there's really no way to stop a divorce if one of the spouses wants it. So other than convincing them to not want it, but um, as far as going to court, if somebody files a petition for dissolution of a marriage and the other party doesn't want to get divorced, there's no legal way to stop it unless the party agrees, the one that filed it, to not proceed with it. For, for whatever reason, they may decide to do that. But a judge is not going to dismiss the divorce because there are no grounds for it. All right, so, oh, and the other, the other way to think about it is um, you will get a divorce even if the other party won't participate. So sometimes you hear a, a saying that I couldn't get a divorce because they wouldn't sign the papers. Uh, there are no papers to be signed in that sense in Illinois divorce uh, law. Instead, the divorce gets filed, and even if the other party doesn't want to participate, and maybe they just ignore it, and they don't want anything to do with it, the divorce will still go through. All right, so what happens in a divorce? Well, primarily, the two people that were married stop being married. It dissolves that marriage, that union, and the parties go from married to unmarried. But there are several other things that get unwound as well. Um, if there are any children involved, there will be orders entered based on the best interest of the children. You may have heard years ago language such as custody or visitation 
in Illinois. And those concepts actually still exist in orders of protection, which we'll talk about in a little while. But in divorce court, and also we'll talk about in unmarried situations where unmarried people have children, the language is now called allocation of parental responsibilities. There was a move away, as I said it a little bit earlier, from winning or losing or winning a custody battle or losing. Now both parents are responsible for the upbringing of the children after the divorce. And parental responsibilities has two parts, parenting time and parental decision-making. So that's really what the judge is looking at right when that divorce gets filed, if there are children involved. In fact, at the very first hearing, the judge is going to ask the parties if they have reached an agreement on parental responsibilities, which means time and decision making just has those two parts. And it's really helpful if the parties can come to that hearing with um, an agreement. It, it makes it all smoother and faster but most likely the parties aren't getting along and that's why they're getting divorced. So if that's the case, if when the judge at that very first hearing says to the parties, um, do you guys have an agreement on the parenting plan, on time and decision-making? If the parties say no, most likely the judge is going to send the parties to what's called mediation. And that's a court ordered required meeting that each of the spouses go to with a third party, which is called a mediator. You sit down at a conference room table, usually without your attorneys, and you just try to find an agreement. And the mediator goes back and forth between the two parties trying to get an agreement on, okay, time and decision making. When clients come to us and they're, they're you know, very hurt and they're in crisis. And we ask them if there's children involved, what would you agree to when it comes to parental time and decision-making? And sometimes the clients are so hurt and in such a space where they say, I don't want the other party to have any contact with the children. No, they're my kids. They're not gonna have any contact with them. And part of our advocacy is to help move that client to see what Illinois law really is which as I've said, assumes both parties will be involved in both the time and the decision-making with respect to the children. There are some exceptions where there has been basically substantial danger to the children um, by actions by the spouse. And that would be a conversation for another day, um, but it has to be pretty serious and it has to involve the children. So um, when the judge is looking at um, this parenting plan idea, and just so you guys know, if you were to um, look on Illinois Legal Aid online or even Google Illinois statewide forms, you would see these sample parenting plans. And they're exactly what I'm sure you would imagine, dividing up you know, when the children will be with which parent and which parent gets to make the decisions. And the decisions really fall into four categories. Um, they are education, healthcare, religion, and believe it or not, extracurricular activities. That was added to the law not that long ago because boy, that is just the basis for a lot of fights. So in this parenting plan, which is just a, a document that the parties sign or that the judge orders if the parties ultimately cannot reach an agreement, dividing up the time with the children and, and these other issues. Thank you, Catherine, for putting that in the checks. That's a, a good place to go for resources, particularly if you are researching this to really understand what's involved, or if you do not have an attorney, um, a place to go for information and documents that you can file. All right, so if the parties end up at mediation to try to reach an agreement and still no agreement can be reached, then um, the judge most likely will appoint what's called a guardian ad litem. And the guardian ad litem is usually an attorney who interviews the children, interviews each of the, of the, the father and the mother, the parents, and also tends to interview the other adults in the children's lives. If there's a babysitter, teachers, counselors, um, grandparents, that sort of thing. 
And the GAL's role, the guardian ad litem GAL's role is to then report back to the judge on what the GAL thinks would be a good parenting plan in the best interests of these children. Unfortunately, typically neither parent is happy with where the GAL lands. So something that we often um, counsel our clients on is if at all possible, reach an agreement. Not that, you know, if it's an abusive situation and we'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes, that might be impossible because the, the other parent may just be um, refusing to compromise and, and make an agreement that makes sense for the family. And in those cases, you just don't have a choice but to go to the judge and um, definitely would want a lawyer to be able to present your evidence as to why the children should spend the time with you or um, that decision-making should be yours in those, in those categories of education, healthcare, um, religion, and extracurricular activities. The other piece of the children that often gets talked about is relocation. So if there is no court case and you have not submitted to the jurisdiction of the court, generally there is freedom to move. You can move your children to a different state. You can make decisions for your children. If you're married, the assumption is, is that both parents make these decisions together. As soon as you submit to the jurisdiction of the court by filing the divorce or the parenting case, you will be limited to where you can move. And right now the law says for our area, 50 miles. Up by Chicago, it's actually shorter, it's 25. But down here in central Illinois, it's 50 miles without the need for court um, approval. So if you wanna to move to a different state, you absolutely would need the court approval, particularly if the other parent did not agree. So that's one of those considerations on whether you should file a divorce or file a court action is it will limit your ability to relocate. In addition, oh, and on the last piece um, with respect to the um, divorce and children, um, one thing that we often recommend is that people, when they are in this situation where there's a divorce contemplated or pending, stay off of social media. So like this Facebook Live, no, I'm talking about posting. So posting on Facebook, posting on Instagram, posting on Snapchat, you know, Twitter, whatnot. You should assume if you are contemplating a family law case or if you're in the middle of one, that everything you do every tweet, every statement, every action, it can be used as evidence in a trial. So that would not be the season of life where you would want to go out drinking. You know, you would want instead to lead, you know, a boring life at home taking care of your kids because that would be the best evidence for your case. Um, unfortunately, you know, these are times of crisis and sometimes, you know, judgment lapses and people go out and you know, and do things that end up on social media and then it becomes a part of their court case. So that is a, a strong recommendation from our office is that when this becomes a reality, a divorce or a family case, to stay off of social media. So in addition to the children issues, or I should say first actually getting divorced, the dissolution of the marriage, and then second, the children issues, the third piece of the, um, divorce case is the property division. And just to touch on that, it's equitable division of property. The starting point is 50-50 on the marital property. It really doesn't matter whose fault it was, who cheated on who, it, it really just doesn't matter. On the, the property, which is both the, the personal property or any houses, land that you own, but also debts, those will be equitably divided. And again, if you can reach an agreement that you know, everybody can live with, great. If not, it's all gonna go before the judge and the judge will decide. As a part of the property issues, there is of course maintenance in Illinois, which is a payment by one spouse to the other. Um, there is a uh, calculation that is done, but the first step is to determine if maintenance is even appropriate. And the judge reviews several factors in deciding that. And if the answer is yes, that maintenance is appropriate, then the amount and the duration are what the judge looks to next. And that's really based on the length of the marriage and the difference 
in current and future earning capacity between the two, the spouses. Um, this would definitely be something that someone would wanna to talk to an attorney about, to talk about your specific situation, how much you make, how much the, your spouse makes, um, earning capacity, how long each of you have been in the job market, if anybody is purposefully underemployed, um, all of those types of issues the attorney would talk with you about. Another issue is child support. So child support is money um, paid by one spouse to another to help with the raising of the children. There, uh, the standard here in Illinois is now an income allocation standard. So the court will look to the income of both, of both parents and the number of nights each parent has each child. And based on that, there's a calculation on basically how much child support each one should put in and then the one that should put in more, that would go to the other spouse. There are many calculators of child support in Illinois on the internet. The Illinois uh, Department of Healthcare and Family Services has such a um, calculator on their website where you put in you know, income and of the one spouse and income of the other spouse, um, how many children, the number of nights with each spouse, and it gives you a rough estimate of what the child support would be. So that pretty much is in the weeds on divorce. Then you have situations where clients apply for our services who are not married, but have children together. And often an issue in that situation is whether someone signed the VAP. It's called a Voluntary Acknowledgement of Paternity. It's often signed in the hospital and at the hospital, um, the hospital, we usually bring this to the woman who, who gave birth to have the father sign it. And it's acknowledging paternity that, um, and that's in a situation where the woman is not married. Um, if it's not signed, then usually what that looks like is the birth certificate does not list a father at all. The big takeaway on this, um, in this area, is that a VAP, the Voluntary Acknowledgement of Paternity, is legally binding if it's not rescinded, um, basically said it's wrong, within 60 days or up to two years. So it's something you got to act on pretty quickly. If, if you're a, a, a man and you are acknowledging paternity for a child, um, if, if it's not you, it's got to get decided pretty quickly or that VAP is as good as a court order. And the idea behind it, again, is best interests of the children, that it would not be in a child's best interest to go 10, 15 years thinking someone was their, their father, only to have that taken away. So it's, it's going to have to be decided pretty quickly. So what does that mean? That means a DNA test will not undo a VAP years later. Um, Parenting plans are involved in these cases. So let's say um, two people are not married, they have a child together, they're living together, everything's fine. Then the relationship breaks down. Again, you do not have to run into court if you guys can reach an agreement between the two of you that you're honoring. There's, there's no rule that requires you to go into court. Um, however, if one of the parties is not holding up their end of the bargain, either taking care of the child or making um, child support payments, that is when um, someone can access the court system for help. And um, in the state of Illinois, there's something called child support enforcement. And child support enforcement is a government agency here locally. It's administered by the attorney general's office and people can apply for assistance through that. And the Illinois Department, um, I'm sorry, the um, Attorney General here locally will help get that uh, petition for child support on file and help um, basically get child support paid. That's, that's their role. Um, or somebody could hire an attorney and do a private action. Just so you know, the court uh, action is not required unless the parent that has the children is on DHS benefits. So if the parent that has the child is getting the food stamp, link card benefits, temporary assistance to needy families, Medicaid, so some of those types of benefits, then the state of Illinois will require um, a petition to have the 
the other parent contribute child support. Uh, and that happens a lot. So if somebody uh, is getting those benefits and not receiving child support, that um, court action may get started by the state of Illinois through the attorney general's office, even if the um, parent that has the children wasn't actively trying to do that. All right, so we've talked about the divorce. We've talked about non-married um, situations where there is a dispute with the children. I wanna talk a little bit about minor guardianships as we uh, close out our time. Minor guardianships also focus on the best interests of the child. And that's a situation where a parent is unwilling or unable to care for the child. So this might come up if you are a neighbor or a relative and um, either your neighbor or your relative has a child and they just can't take care of them anymore and they ask you to take care of them. If it's for a short term, it can be what's called a short term guardianship in Illinois and that does not require court intervention um, or, and that's good for a year, up to a year, or you can go into court and the standard again is that the parent is unwilling or unable to care for the child and you can get a court ordered guardianship over a child. Sometimes the um, biological parents are allowed uh, parenting time in those situations. So it's very possible a parenting plan gets entered in those minor guardianship actions. Um, adult guardianship, I just wanted to touch on briefly, um, is different, but it's also called a guardianship. Adult guardianships are appropriate where the person who will be the subject of the guardianship is disabled and they are not able to care for either their person or their money, their person or their finances. And in that case, um, a doctor's report is needed basically from the primary care doctor of that disabled adult stating the extent of the disability and the person who is caring for that disabled adult would take that doctor's report and file a petition in court asking that the court find the disabled adult is too disabled to manage their person and or their finances and to name that petitioner as the guardian. There's a lot of responsibilities that come with being the guardian of a disabled adult, um, particularly in making sure that they're cared for and that their bills are being paid. And if that's ever something that's in your life for any of our viewers, you definitely will want to do research on that and talk to an attorney. A power of attorney is slightly different in the sense that it could achieve the same results, meaning you can help somebody with their healthcare decisions or their finances, but a power of attorney is a document that is signed by an individual before they become too disabled to sign such a document. So while they're still competent, this comes up sometimes with folks that um, have early onset of dementia or Alzheimer's that while they are still competent, they can name in a power of attorney who in their life they want to make healthcare decisions for them and financial decisions for them once they become too disabled to make those decisions for themselves. If that person signed a power of attorney for healthcare or a power of attorney for property, then, they would, then their loved ones would not have to go to court to get guardianship over them because most likely all decisions would be able to be made using the power of attorney. Um, just one more piece on that, on a power of attorney for healthcare, the person can still make decisions for themselves at the doctor's office. It's just when they stop being able to make those decisions that the medical providers will turn to the power of attorney to make those decisions. That's not the case with a power of attorney for property, which is the money power of attorney. On the power of attorney for property, that will go into effect right away. So as you're thinking through, who do I want to be my power of attorney? On the property power of attorney really has to be somebody you trust because as soon as you execute that, as soon as you sign it, then that person who is your power of attorney can take that power of attorney to your bank and withdraw all your money. And they would be allowed to do that as your power of attorney. So it really has to be somebody you trust. And I wanna just finish off by saying that um, 
The work we do at Prairie State, as I said at the beginning, in this area of family law is for domestic violence victims primarily. We are able to help some clients who are not just uh, victims of domestic violence in this area of family law, but on a very limited basis. As I said, we never charge attorney's fees. We pay our bills through grants and private donations. And most of our grants relating to these family law issues are related to helping domestic violence survivors, um, which also includes child abuse victims and seniors who are being exploited. Um, in that area of um, domestic violence, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. One is they primarily come to us as orders of protection. And orders of protection primarily um, deal with domestic situations. I, there's, there's a relationship involved where it's a family member, a, a roommate, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, someone you have a child in common with, um, or a relative, sister, brother, or mother, father, grandparent uh, type situation. And in that um, order of protection, the abused person is alleging that the abuser um, either harassed them, physically abused them, threatened them. When you file that, you actually have to go to court to file it. And on the day the survivor goes to court and fills out the petition and writes the allegations of what happened, the judge then hears those allegations almost always the same day. And the abuser doesn't have notice of this. It's just the, the domestic violence victim there in front of the judge. And there's usually an advocate there in the courthouse to help the um, domestic violence survivor move through the process. And, um, sorry about that. And uh, in, that, in that situation, the um, judge will hear it on an emergency basis and then um, enter the order if the judge believes the allegations meet the requirements of the statute and the order will be good for about a week to 10 days. And then there's another hearing and the abuser does have notice of that hearing. And at that hearing, the judge will decide if the evidence supports ordering a two-year order of protection or up to a two-year. That would then limit the contact that the respondent, the alleged abuser, can have to the survivor. Similarly, and the last thing I just want to raise is there is this thing called a stalking no contact order. And a stalking no contact order is similar in some ways to an order of protection but the stalking no contact order does not require a special relationship, like a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, family member. Instead, a stalking no contact order can be really against anybody that is harassing you. It can be between neighbors, it can be school bullying situations. And um, the standard for these stalking no contact orders, and really this is the takeaway, is two instances. You have to show two times where the um, petitioner told the alleged abuser, leave me alone. And they did not respect that, that expressed desire for no contact. So that's really the key. It can't be like a back and forth neighbors screaming at each other. That doesn't count. It really has to be a situation where the neighbor or you know, the other person comes up to you and you say, leave me alone and they won't. And if that happens twice, then you would have the allegations for a stalking no contact order. So I've covered a lot of family law that Prairie State does. Um, the big takeaway is if this ends up being your reality or someone you know's reality, I would encourage you to have them call Prairie State Legal Services. The other resource out there is the Center for Prevention of Abuse. Over most of Prairie State's service area that I cover, the Center for Prevention of Abuse also covers, and they are not attorneys, but they are advocates for survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, child abuse. They are the court advocates who, if you go to the Peoria County Courthouse or the Tazewell County Courthouse, they are the ones there to help the survivor walk through the application process to file a petition for an order of protection or a stalking no contact order. They also provide counseling services um, as a part of their services at the Center for Prevention of Abuse. So just to wrap up, again, I am Denise Conklin, 
and I am an attorney at Prairie State Legal Services, and it really has been a pleasure to share with you more about what we do, and I look forward to our next session, where, uh, which will be our last session, where we will talk about um, our Ready to Work program. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. You shared a lot of really valuable information there, I think. Um, so for those watching on Zoom as well as on Facebook, um, feel free to submit any questions if you have some at this point. Uh, you can type them into the chat. Please remember to keep them general in nature because this is a recorded program. Um, you can also use the raise hand tool on Zoom if you'd like to ask your question verbally and I can unmute you so that you can ask that. So we'll just give it a couple minutes here to see anyone, if anyone has questions. You hear the lawnmower out there? I don't know. <laughs> I have my window open. I probably should have closed it. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing any questions here, so you must have covered all the ground. Um, but again, this recording will be available. So if anyone who's watching knows someone that might be interested in it or could use some of that information, please feel free to pass it on. I'll include that link in the follow-up email to um, the webinar. And then it'll also be on, on Facebook and, and YouTube. So I think that's it for tonight. Um, we do have an anonymous survey when you leave the webinar. So if you'd like to leave us a little bit of feedback, that would be great. But otherwise, I think that's all I have. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add, Denise? I don't. Thank you again, Catherine. Sure. Thanks very much. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.